to click 200 mute buttons. <laughs> no, no, there's one button it's for mute all participants. Well, uh, you are obviously much more uh, into this thing because uh, I'm. Um, I think that okay. now we, we, we are online. Professor, do you mind? Do yeah. We start again. Yeah, let's start again. Yeah, let's start again with the history. Yes, yes, please. Sorry. Maybe, maybe a few words. Maybe. Okay. So, maybe, yeah. so briefly, let's just summarize this slide of short history. The brain was first discovered to be electrically excitable. You know, you could stimulate with an electric pulse like you could a nerve uh, in the 1870s. Um, and when people did the same thing in humans, and neurosurgeons often stimulate the brain with electricity to map out the motor and the sensory cortex, they usually use uh, a train of stimulation, many stimuli that will last over a period of half a second to a second. Uh, and this produces the movement that you can see during operations on, on the brain. Um, there are several attempts in the 20th century to try and replicate that in healthy, conscious people uh, by stimulating through the intact scalp. In other words, so could you do this in, in healthy people in the lab? Um, it is possible to get the electricity through the scalp into the brain, but the scalp's got a very high resistance to electric current, and you have to use a very high voltage to get enough current through the high resistance to stimulate the brain underneath. And if you use repetitive stimulation of the scalp at a high voltage for half a second or a second, it hurts. So these attempts generally didn't succeed. It wasn't because they, it's impossible to do, it just is unpleasant. Um, the real breakthrough is, is one of those very simple things uh, which uh, almost looks so simple as, as to be obvious uh, in retrospect, was that Merton and Morton in 1980 showed that you didn't need to have a train of stimuli, uh, electric stimuli, uh, to activate the brain through the scalp. Uh, you just needed one, especially in a, a conscious, healthy human being. Uh, so one single short but high voltage electric pulse uh, could actually activate the motor cortex and produce movements on the opposite side of the body. And that was the first real demonstration of electric of brain stimulation in humans. Uh, this picture here uh, is actually uh, the first public demonstration of the technique. That's Merton sitting down. He's being stimulated not by Morton, but by someone else. And he's simply saying, if I stimulate here on this side of the brain, I can produce movements of the hand on this side of the body. The stimulus is just a single stimulus. It lasts uh, less than a millisecond. And it's produced by discharging this electric capacitor uh, through the electrode to the scalp. Um, very simple, and it works every time. There's a very simple observation you can also make from this experiment. Not only is there a connection there, but the size of the response that you get, the size of the muscle twitch you produce, is much bigger if the stimulus is given during a constant voluntary contraction than it is at rest. Um, in other words, the response of this brain to the same stimulus depends on how excitable the pathway is at the time you give the stimulus. And that's a very important thing uh, that you must remember. And it makes it quite different than stimulating a peripheral nerve with an electric pulse. If you stimulate a peripheral nerve with an electric pulse, you always get the same response. Uh, that's not true in the brain. And that's mainly because you're activating a much more complex circuitry. Um, and as I said, this uh, electric stimulation, it uses a single pulse. It is a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, and people generally don't perceive it as particularly pleasant. And so avoid it. Um, so the real breakthrough came six years later when Barker invented his magnetic method of stimulation. And the basic the principle of this is simple. The skull has got high resistance to electricity, but the skull has got virtually no resistance to the passage of a magnetic field. So magnetism penetrates the brain, and the magnetic stimulator uses a magnetic field to induce an electric current in the brain. So it uses a field to carry the electric stimulus into the brain 
maintain this, and that's what everybody uses these days. Uh, in principle, it works a bit like this. You have a coil of wire that's held on the outside of the head. This is a coil of wire here. And uh, you discharge a capacitor through the coil of wire. It produces a very high current for about a millisecond, and that produces a magnetic field according to Faraday's rules. Uh, and the magnetic field penetrates the brain. And because it's a time-varying magnetic field, it induces electric current in the brain. Uh, so the magnetic field looks like this. It goes up to about two Teslas and back down to zero in about a millisecond. And the pulse in the brain follows a time differential. So basically, it's a pulse of electricity in the brain, like you would use to stimulate a peripheral nerve, just a single pulse. Um, the other thing is that the magnetic field falls off rapidly with distance from the coil. And effectively, so this is distance from the coil in centimetres. This is a coil outside the head. Um, so effectively, magnetic stimulation works really well if you want to stimulate the outside cortex of the brain, and it's not so good for stimulating the inside of the brain. Um, it was attempted in the early 1900s by this person, Sylvanus P. Thompson, uh, who still tried to stimulate his own brain uh, magnetically, but actually failed. He stimulated the retina, which is quite sensitive to electric stimulation. Uh, so Barker was the first person to do it in the human brain. Um, the coils that we use, I'm sorry, I'll just go back to that picture. Uh, here, the current in the brain, if you use a circular loop like this, follows a circle underneath the loop. There's no stimulation in the middle of the loop, uh, so the induced current covers quite a large area underneath the uh, magnetic stimulator. You can see in the diagram here from um, Tony Barker, the, 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 the loop can be quite big. In other words, you would think the stimulus is not very focal. And in fact, with that sort of coil, it isn't very focal. Uh, but what people use these days are these coils. These are two circles of current which overlap in the middle. Each of the circles induces an electric current underneath its outline, but where the circles overlap, you get twice as much current in the middle. And so you get the focal stimulus in the middle. Uh, you want to know what happens when you stimulate the brain. As I said, it's much more complex than stimulating the nerve. And I think it's worthwhile just spending a couple of slides illustrating how complicated it is, because if you want to use TMS, you really need to know how it works. So if you stimulate the motor cortex, in the motor cortex, you might find the pyramidal neurons in the cortex, and they have the axons, the corticospinal axons that go to the spinal cord. When you stimulate with TMS, you usually activate inputs to the corticospinal neurons, excitatory inputs that make them discharge and then produce activity in the spinal cord and the muscle. Um, if you use the electric method, you, in contrast, you actually stimulate the axon of the neuron directly uh, and produce a much simpler response. The difference is just to do with the distribution of electric current in the brain that the two stimuli, types of stimuli produce. Um, the point is that when you stimulate the brain, you see you're producing synaptic activity here, and this neuron will also activate other neurons somewhere else, and you're going to get a very complex pattern of activation. You can actually record in humans during surgery uh, if you insert an electrode uh, into between the spinal vertebrae and insert it into the dorsal epidural space of the cord, you can actually record the activity of these axons as they descend into the spinal cord. Uh, if you stimulate with an electric current, you can see a single wave of activity pass underneath your electrode. That's the stimulus to the brain. Uh, little poles, and then you can record the activity under your electrode in the cord. If you stimulate with magnetic stimulation, you st also see a small response here, but it's later because it's got to go across this synapse and activate the brain. Uh, the, if you turn the stimulus up, you get repetitive activation, um, which indicates that you're producing a complex pattern of activity in the brain.
Uh, not only do you get that excitatory effect in the brain, but you stimulate the brain. You can't decide which class of neurons you want to stimulate. You can stimulate all of them. And you've got to get a very mixed effect from all those different types of neurons. You certainly get activity in inhibitory neurons, GABAergic neurons, uh, because you can see it very easily. So a single stimulus excites the neurons and produces a short burst of firing, and that produces the NEP that you record. But that's followed by a longer period of inhibition, um, which outlasts the excitation for many more milliseconds. And you can see it when you stimulate the brain. So here's stimulation of the brain, uh, gradually increasing intensities, and the stimulus comes here, and the response comes here. So we stimulate, you get your response, which is produced by that excitatory bombardment of the cortical spinal neurons. But afterwards, there's no activity. There's what we call a silent period in the EMG, where nothing can get through. You're voluntarily contracting the muscle, but the motor cortex doesn't pass on that contraction to the spinal cord because of the big GABAergic inhibition that's there. And this can last for 100 milliseconds or more. The net result of all that is when you stimulate the brain, you interrupt any processing which is going on in that region for 100 or 200 milliseconds. You produce a very transient region of functional activation. And some people refer to this as a virtual lesion study. John, excuse me, yeah. uh, uh, could you maybe... Uh, Paul, uh, turn down a little bit your microphone because it looks like people on YouTube say uh, that the sound is a bit distorted because okay. the microphone yeah. is too sensitive. Uh, well, I'm okay. not sure about that, but that's the feedback I get. Uh, well, I can try to do that. Um, that's not there. Uh, let's see here. Um, let's see. see if this is any better. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, back. Right. So, tell me if this is any better. I'll, I'll, I'll just try and sit a little further from the microphone as well. Um, so here we've got a complex mixture of activation in the brain that's produced by a single pulse inhibition and excitation mixed up together and it interferes with processing in the brain um, for about 100 to 200 milliseconds. If you really want to know what the TMS pulse is stimulating, where it is stimulating neurons in the brain, uh, there are some complex models of this available and the models show us where the TMS pulse produces the greatest activation uh, and here's a picture of the pre and the post central gyrus, the motor cortex down here, and the sensory cortex here. And it says stimulus is mostly at the surface and not within the gyrus, which is fair enough. Uh, and then there are models that say, well, which bit, which neurons and which bits of the neurons do you stimulate? We first thought that the stimulus ought to activate large diameter axons, perhaps in the white matter. Because in peripheral nerve, when you stimulate electrically, you activate the largest axons first. They have the lowest threshold. But in the brain, things are probably a bit different. The, a good side, a probable site of activation is the synaptic terminals of neurons. Uh, and more than that, it's the synaptic terminals, it's directionally dependent on the direction of the current pulse induced by the magnetic field. So, this is a picture of a neuron here in layer four of the cortex, and the neuron cell body is here, it's got some dendrites here, and it's got axon branches all over the cortex here, and some of them perhaps leaving the cortex. And it says, 
that if you have a stimulus pulse which produces a, an electric current from uh, posterior to anterior, excuse me, um, in this direction, then you will activate those synapses which are aligned in the direction of the pulse. That's the green ones. The electricity goes in the axon and it comes out at the synapse when you do the stimulation. Uh, synapses in pointing in the other direction are actually hyperpolarized. The current goes into the synapse and comes out uh, at the axon. So if you're interested, this sort of model is quite interesting, but it also shows you how complex what you're doing in the brain can, can be. Um, okay, so that's the background. Let's have a look at some TMS applications uh, within um, the controls. May, may I ask a, a question? Yes. Uh, does that mean that there is a potential for some of the effects being antidromic? Uh, yes, some of the effects could well be antidromic. Uh, because what, if you do stimulate an axon and activate an axon, you will get activation in both directions. Um, you'll activate the synapse up here, but you'll also send an antidromic potential perhaps back to the cell body where you might then get invasion of the dendrites <laughs> with, with the pulse. And that will affect how the dendrites respond to synaptic input. So... It's, 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 it's complex. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. That's the message from all this. It's, it's, it's complex. Um, and beware when you use a technique uh, that you're aware of these matters. John, uh, yeah. maybe to follow up uh, Gregor's question, uh, can um, neurons in the cortex produce something like an F wave? So can they backfire in response to the antidromic stimulus? Uh, I, I don't know whether they actually backfire, but what happens is an antidromic potential goes into the cell body and then it can spread into the dendrites and sometimes, it, and, and in doing so, it can sometimes activate calcium channels which depolarize the dendrites further, which makes them more responsive to uh, excitatory inputs. So that's what it, that's what it does. It doesn't discharge a neuron yet again, as in an F-wave, uh, at least as far as I can recall. Um, but it does change the way the cell responds to synaptic in inputs for a very short period afterwards. Thank you. So, okay, these are TMS applications in motor control. Uh, and it was first used to test the corticospinal system, the connections from motor cortex to muscle. Uh, and it also can be used to test how excitable those connections are. Because like I said, the size of the response depends upon the excitability of the connection at the time you stimulate it. So we can look at buildup of excitability prior to a movement, for example. Uh, you can also use it to test connections within the brain. You can stimulate one bit of brain and see what effect it has on other bits of the brain. Uh, you can use it in a virtual lesion mode uh, where you knock out the brain for 100 or 200 milliseconds, like I said. Um, and then there's some plasticity studies where you use repetitive stimulation to induce changes in synaptic plasticity. So I'll, I'll go through examples of all these things, uh, hopefully in the remaining time. So testing connectivity. Um, in the, in the corticospinal system, you stimulate the brain, the motor cortex, and you can get a movement on the other side of the body. That's a simple test of connectivity. It's actually remarkably useful. Uh, you think it's simple, but it's actually really useful. Uh, it's useful after stroke. After a, a stroke, which damages the corticospinal output system, <clears throat> patients are weak immediately after the stroke. Uh, and they often might not be able to move the contralateral arm or, or leg. This is certainly be weak. Uh, but most stroke survivors actually recover to some extent. Uh, in fact, there's a little rule called the 70% rule, which goes something like 70% of patients who have a stroke recover 70% of what they've lost. It's rough, you know, <laughs> but it's a, it's a, it's a nice little uh, thing to remember. 
30% of patients don't recover that much. Who are those patients? Uh, well, using TMS is quite easy to detect who is likely to be in that 30% group. Um, and it's simple. If TMS can evoke a movement in a stroke survivor in the 48 hours after the stroke, then the chances of recovery of movement are high. If there is no response, the chances are small. Um, it, it means that if there's some evidence early on of a corticospinal connection that can be accessed, then recovery is likely to be quite good. If there is no evidence of connection, then it's likely to be bad. In fact, this sort of TMS finding uh, correlates with what you can see in MRI studies, which show the extent of the lesion of the corticospinal system. The fact is that the TMS method is remarkably simple, very cheap, and uh, easy to do. So that's testing connectivity. Um, you can look at TMS, you use TMS to probe what happens before a movement by probing the excitability of the system to see if the excitability of certain pathways changes uh, when you prepare to do different things. A very simple example is this. You can say, does the reaction time of a person depend on the rate of rise of corticospinal excitability? So the idea many people have is that before you move, one of the things you're going to have to do is charge up the motor cortex, bring the motor cortex to threshold so that it then discharges impulses and produces a movement. Uh, that's a rise to threshold model of movement preparation. And so you can say, well, do slow reaction times have a slow buildup of excitability uh, and vice versa? Well, we can actually answer that question by doing the experiment. We can actually measure the rise of corticospinal activity prior to a movement by giving TMS pulses before the onset of movement. And here's an example of a paper by Tibor Ortobagi and colleagues. Uh, older people have slower reaction times than younger people. That's a known fact. Sadly, it's a known fact. Uh, how do their rates of rise of cortical activity, corticospinal activity compare? Do older people have a slow rise of corticospinal excitability because they're geriatric and very slow? Uh, and do young people have a very, very brisk rise of corticospinal activity and therefore have a very short reaction time? Uh, well, here goes, let's have a look. Um, here's what happens when you do the experiment. The experiment's simple. It says, flex your wrist after you hear this buzz. Uh, it's very simple. This is the EMG response. This is a young person. This is a triphasic EMG pattern in the flexor and extensor muscles. Uh, and we're measuring the onset of EMG activity in the flexor. Uh, that's a young person, older person here, nice triphasic pattern, but the onset of activity in the flexor is later than the younger person. Is it late because the older person has a slower rise of excitability in the motor cortex to some threshold value. But let's do some TMS pulses and see what the excitability looks like prior to the onset of EMG. So look at bottom B is the onset of EMG activity. Uh, all, all the people have been lined up and the onset of EMG activity in the flexor muscle has been plotted for the young and the old groups. And there's the EMG group. Okay, so there we are. So let's have a look at the excitability of the corticospinal system before the movement here by giving some TMS pulses and measuring the size of the response we get. Um, what we see is that prior to the onset of movement, the excitability of the corticospinal system, that's the size of the motor response we get by stimulating with a constant size of pulse, uh, at the beginning, uh, 80 milliseconds before the movement, not much of a response. Come to 60 and 40 milliseconds before a movement, the response gets bigger and bigger, and you see it gets quite big very shortly before the onset of the EMG. So there is a buildup of excitability in the motor cortex. The point is, it's exactly the same for the old and the younger people. Uh, and it means that the difference in reaction time isn't due 
to changes in the rate of rise of excitability in the motor cortex. It's to do with something else. In other words, it's rather nice as an, an older person to know that my motor cortex, at least, is doing pretty well. Uh, it's other parts of the brain have slowed down, not my motor system. Uh, so that's connectivity studies. How about using TMS as a lesion? Like I said, you give a TMS pulse, especially if you give a large TMS pulse, you disrupt the activity of the bit that's been stimulated for 200 milliseconds or even more, depending on how big a shock you give. This was first illustrated in a lovely experiment I'll show you here. It's on, on the visual cortex by Massey et al. years and years ago. Um, and it was simple. So the experiment goes like this. Three letters are presented very briefly on a computer screen at time zero. They're on the screen for about two or three milliseconds and they're faint. They can just be perceived. Uh, and you have to identify the letters that are on the screen. They're random letters. A, B, K, Z, Q, B, or whatever. And you simply have to repeat what letters you've seen. So the letters go on the screen here, and you say how many letters you're correct. And these are three different individuals who are reporting. Uh, then, if you give a TMS pulse to the occipital cortex, the visual cortex, um, 50, 100 milliseconds later, later than the pulse has been presented, remember, then pay, people say they can't see it. They say they perceive nothing has become on the screen and they can't see the letters. If you give the TMS pulse to the visual cortex later on, then they can see the letters once again. This says that the visual information's gone in at this point in time here. If you stimulate the visual cortex 100 milliseconds later, you disrupt the perception of the visual stimulus. It means basically it takes about 60 milliseconds or so for the visual input to get to the visual cortex. And if you interfere with its visual cortex function at that time with your TMS pulse, you will no longer be able to perceive it. You've really interfered with the operation of the visual cortex. So that's the first demonstration of a virtual lesion. You can actually see something quite similar in the motor system. Uh, this is an example where, um, again, it's a wrist flexor uh, reaction time experiment. The go signal occurs here. You flex your wrist here, uh, and you have this black, a solid black triphasic pattern of muscles, of flexors, and extensors. Bah, bang, bang. So the black ones. If you give the TMS pulse after the go signal, but before the onset of movement, the TMS pulse it might produce an MEP response, but ignore that for the moment. The important point is that the TMS pulse delays the onset of the movement. It's a bit different than the visual system. In the visual system, we actually um, uh, interfered entirely with perception of the visual stimulus. Here, it imposes a delay in the movement. The movement itself, although it's delayed, is exactly the same. The EMG burst, which is the dotted lines here, is simply a time-shifted version of the original EMG burst. It's a very interesting observation that's still a bit of a puzzle, really. <coughs> it says that although you've interfered badly with the operation of the motor cortex, somewhere there has been stored, somehow, the instructions for the movement. After the period of the interruption, the function, the movement recovers. And in fact, it's exactly the same as it was before. Um, so that's another example of a virtual lesion effect. Here's a useful example of it in a, a, a motor control scenario. And again, it's a stroke study. In a stroke, uh, you often see in functional imaging studies, you often see increased activity in the dorsal premotor cortex during attempted hand movements. So people who've got a stroke, they're weak. When they try to move their weak hand, they might have some activation in the motor cortex, as usual, but there's also more activity in the premotor cortex, 
more activity than in normal, and often that activity is bilateral uh, rather than unilateral. Um, and people say when they look at uh, an MRI picture, they say, oh, well, that, that extra activity must be compensatory. Well, of course, you don't know it's compensatory. It could just be something happens at the same time. Uh, to show that it's compensatory, you have to show that if you interfere with that activity, then the movements get worse. And that's exactly what you can do with TMS. Uh, we can do the experiment, ask people to move their hand, and then we can disrupt the activity with the dorsal premotor cortex, with the TMS pulse, and see if the movement gets worse. And in fact, it does. Uh, the actual experiment says that if you give TMS pulse to the dorsal premotor cortex, 100 milliseconds after a go signal, then it will delay the onset of the voluntary reaction in these recovered stroke patients. But it doesn't delay voluntary reactions in healthy people. Uh, so from that, you would conclude that the extra activity in the dorsal premotor cortex is indeed compensatory. Uh, there's also a nice experiment here in blind individuals that you, you could look up. Okay, so let's have a look at connectivity within the brain. So when you do TMS to the motor cortex, you activate many outputs in addition to those in the corticospinal tract. So the motor cortex you activate, you activate the corticospinal output, output to the opposite side of the brain, transcalosal output, output to the basal ganglia, output to the cerebellum, output back to the thalamus, etc., etc., etc. And you can actually visualize this with other methods. Uh, and we can also look at the other way around. We can look at inputs to the motor cortex from other parts of the brain. Uh, to do the latter, we do what we call double pulse experiments. So if you want to uh, look at the input to the motor cortex from other parts of the brain, what we do is a double pulse experiment. In these experiments, we may stimulate the motor cortex here and produce a response. We then can stimulate any other part of the brain beforehand in order to test its effect on the motor cortex response we get. This is what we call transcalosal inhibition. Uh, I stimulate the opposite motor cortex at different times before the motor cortex and see how it changes the response. So response to the test stimulus alone produces a response this big. If we give the opposite side of the brain a stimulus five milliseconds earlier, nothing happens, it's the same. If we give the stimulus six, seven, eight milliseconds, nine milliseconds, we see there's no response. So stimulating here has inhibited motor cortex on this side, uh, and it's taken 10 milliseconds for the uh, information to get from one side to the other, probably through the colossal pathway. Now you can plot a little time course of this, uh, showing the, the interval between the two stimuli, and you see the effect is maximal at around 10 milliseconds, and it lasts for 10 milliseconds or so. Uh, we refer to that as transcalosal inhibition. Um, again, just remember, as with other connectivity studies, the amount of inhibition you see changes when people do different things. So, for example, at rest, MEPs in the right hand may be inhibited to 60% of their control value by conditioning stimulus to the opposite side of the brain. Um, but if you are contracting the left hand, then the response is will be more suppressed. That was an example of a double pulse experiment looking at connectivity. Like I said, you can look at connectivity with other techniques. You interface TMS, in this case, with fMRI. Uh, so you TMS in the fMRI system. Uh, this is Sven Bessman, who was the first person to do it, um, the second person to do it. Um, and he stimulated the motor cortex and the sensory cortex on this side. And what he's done, he's actually got um, a negative bold effect on the other side, equivalent probably to the 
transcalosal inhibition that we saw. However, stimulating here also activates other areas. This is supplementary motor area. This is premotor area here. The activation down here is in the temporal cortex, and actually that is produced by the click that the stimulus produces when it discharges in the coil. So that's an auditory effect. Uh, not only can you see activations when you activate the motor cortex in cortical regions, you can actually look and see activations in deep structures. There's a cerebellum here. There's a basal ganglia, uh, and, the, and the, here we are, we've got some signals uh, in the brain stem uh, and in the basal ganglia, perhaps up here. So that's one way of looking at connectivity. And you can also use EEG to look at connectivity. You can stimulate the brain in one part uh, and watch the activity spread to other regions uh, over the period of time. In this case, you're stimulating here, activity spreads backwards here, and then forwards uh, over a period of about 300 milliseconds. It's interesting that the amount of spread you see in this sort of experiment um, is much less in disorders of consciousness. This is just giving someone an anaesthetic, and you see that anaesthetic halts the spread of that activity from the TMS site to other parts of the brain. Let me give you an example of a connectivity study in motor control. Um, this is a, an experiment by Marco Devar, and it's a reach to grasp movement. So when you've reached grasp an object, you have to integrate the visual information to produce an appropriate orientation of grasp in order to grasp the object. And that involves choosing activation of the appropriate muscles uh, before the movement. Now, primate experiments, the grasp component driven by M1 depends upon input from the ventral premotor cortex. Ventral premotor cortex in these experiments appears to provide to the motor cortex uh, some information about what grasp to use to uh, pick up the object. So we can say, well, I wonder if we can see the same sort of thing going on in humans. Let's do a double pulse experiment. Let's test whether the connection between the ventral premotor cortex and motor cortex changes when before you grasp or changes when you prepare to grasp different sorts of objects. Uh, and is the change specific to the muscles involved in the task? So here's an experiment. These are two objects. One is a pen, a long, thin thing, and you have to pick that up. We don't have to, but when you pick it up, you usually pick it up with what we call a pincer grip. That's a pincer grip. Uh, and the main muscle that you use when you're doing a pincer grip is the first dorsal interosseous muscle, which lies here. That's one object. Second object is a disc, which is much bigger. And to get hold of the disc, you have to open your hand fully uh, and use uh, a full hand grip. And to do that, one of the muscles you use is by the little finger to spread the hand out, and that's called the ADM muscle. So let's look at how does the connection between PMV and motor cortex uh, change when you see the object and prepare to grasp it? So this is the experiment. Uh, this is a blank screen, an opaque screen. The object is presented behind it. Uh, the opaque screen goes clear, uh, and you lift your hand and pick up the object. This is a pen, uh, and picking it up with a precision grip. And in this particular grip, the FDI muscle, the FDI muscle is activated most. The ADM muscle of the little finger isn't activated at all because the little finger isn't doing anything at all. Here, in the whole hand grasp of the disc, uh, you spread your fingers apart. And one of the muscles that helps spread the little finger apart here is the ADM muscle. And the FDI muscle here isn't really doing very much. Okay, so let's do the experiment. Uh, and the experiment is like this. We stimulate the PMV before the M1. Uh, 
and see whether or not the connectivity in this system changes when you prepare to grasp these objects. And in particular, will the projection to the FDI muscle and the ADM muscle differ depending upon which object you pick up? Here we go. So here we go. We see the object and then immediately have to reach and pick it up. Uh, and we move over here and we test the connectivity in between these two time points. And it's a connectivity between the ventral premotor cortex and the motor cortex. This is the interval between, in milliseconds, between the premotor and motor cortex. And, um, and this is the change in excitability of the motor cortex. Now, if you do this at rest, you see virtually nothing. Stimulate the premotor cortex, ventral premotor cortex, it virtually has no effect on M1 excitability. But if you stimulate the motor cortex, premotor cortex here, then it has a big effect on the excitability of the motor cortex. And in particular, if you see a pen, then the excitability, uh, the, the premotor cortex excites the projection to the FDI muscle. You know, it, it produces an increase in excitability of the FDI muscle, but it has no effect on the ADM muscle. Whereas if you see a disc, the premotor cortex seems to activate the ADM muscle, but not the uh, FDI muscle. So in other words, the premotor cortex to motor cortex connectivity changes before you grasp them. The premotor cortex excites or facilitates those muscles which you are likely to use to pick up the object. And it has no effect on those muscles that you're not going to use. So the premotor cortex is sending to the motor cortex specific information telling it what distribution of muscle activity in the hand is appropriate to pick up this object that you've just seen. All this is happening before you actually move. So it's preparatory activity. Okay. Now, at that point, um, Mark, I don't know whether we should have a little pause or shall I carry on? Or perhaps um, no I guess it's up to you, John. So it depends how you feel. So if you want to take a three-minute break, it's fine. If you want to continue, it's also fine. Well, let's continue. Let's, uh, <laughs> otherwise I probably won't finish. So here we go. Okay. Last thing is about um, repetitive stimulation of the brain. This is what people use a lot. Uh, and they'll use it quite a lot because they think it will affect synaptic plasticity. So repetitive stimulation of the brain with TMS means you give several hundred or thousand pulses to the brain, uh, one after the other. Uh, this can take several minutes. Um, and if you, it, what it does is basically it activates the same synapses over and over again. You stimulate the same area, you get the same synaptic activation repeatedly. The concept is that by repeatedly activating the same synapses, you will change their strength, at least temporarily, uh, in a process which might resemble uh, long-term potentiation or long-term depression of cortical synapses. Um, you can get potentiation or depression depending upon the pattern of stimulation that you apply. Some Rapid high frequency stimulation, for example, often produces an increase in excitability. Slower frequency uh, repetitive activation often produces an inhibition or, or, or a depression of excitability. Um, these effects appear to be involving synaptic activity in humans because they are abolished by drugs that interfere with NMDA receptors, these are receptors that glutamate synapses in the brain, which are essential for producing changes in synaptic plasticity. So, uh, this is the sort of thing that you see in the motor cortex. This is the sort of evidence people have that repeatedly stimulating the brain uh, 
can produce after effects on the brain that outlast the period of stimulation. It's really quite an extraordinary phenomenon. You could do this in humans. So here's an example from my colleagues. Uh, what they do is they give a stimulus to the, the motor cortex, a single stimulus, record the response and say, that's the excitability uh, of the motor cortex. Here it is, it's one. Let's give a period of repetitive stimulation to the brain. This is a technique called intermittent theta burst stimulation. It's just a way of describing how the pulses are applied in order to, uh, to the brain. This one's a fairly rapid uh, protocol, only lasts a couple of minutes, but it produces 600 stimuli in a couple of minutes. Uh, you give that stimulation to the motor cortex, uh, and then you test the excitability of the motor cortex for several minutes afterwards. And what you see is that the motor cortex excitability increases for the next half hour or so after this uh, repetitive stimulation. It's abolished by this drug memantine that affects NMDA receptors, and so it's likely to be related in some way. That's about as close as we can get to synaptic plasticity. So that's great, and it's, it's fascinating you can do that. Uh, how is this practically useful? Um, well, useful because not only does the repetitive activation change the response of the brain to the TMS pulses, uh, it also changes how the brain uh, responds to other things in that 30-minute period. Uh, in particular, you can show that there are behavioural effects occurring in that 30-minute period. Um, in particular, they can increase or decrease the speed of persistence of motor learning. In other words, by giving the repetitive stimulation to the motor cortex, it changes how well you can learn to do new movements. This particular example is learning to do this rapid abduction movement of the thumb. It's usually the left hand. It's particularly difficult movement. Uh, and what you do is you put an accelerometer on the thumb, measure the acceleration of the moving thumb. Uh, and if you practice that movement over time, you, you, you get a bit better like the blue line here, you get about a 25% increase in acceleration. You learn to do the movement better. It's better because you activate the right muscles at the right time by the right amount. Uh, and this is a process that you have to learn. If you come back the next day, you find that you are still good at it. Now in this experiment, uh, that repetitive stimulation to the brain was given here, or a sham was given, uh, and then the movements were made afterwards. The learning was conducted after the brain had been preconditioned with the repetitive TMS. Uh, what you see is that the real stimulation increases the rate, uh, increases your performance. At the end, you get to about 50% better rather than 25%. So it's improved your learning. Mark, so, can I interrump you for a minute? Yeah. The job? Sure. It's yeah. Mindy here. Um, can we uh, discuss a bit what you mean by learning? Because uh, this isn't a task that somebody doesn't know how to do. I mean, this isn't a novel task. No. They're just getting better, I think, at yeah. uh, doing this rapidly. So they're kind of training the muscle or getting better muscle contractile efficiency. <clears throat> so can you just uh, address that for a second? Yeah. Well, the, I mean, the, what they're doing here is uh, they're learning to activate the right muscle, I think. Uh, at the right time. So it's a complex movement involving several muscles. And so you have to activate the right agonist and suppress the antagonist in order to produce the increase in acceleration. Uh, you're not changing the muscle properties in any way because it only takes you 10 minutes of practice to, to get better. Uh, so I think you're just learning to direct your motor commands to the optimal set of muscles uh, to use it. I've, I've said it's a learning experiment because it is to an extent because you are still better when you come back the next day to perform the task. So you've, you've learned to do this, this, this movement. It, it's, it's not, I, I agree, it's certainly not the same as learning to do something that you couldn't do before. Uh, 
uh, it's simply improving your performance on a task. But it's not improving performance by by uh, increasing the bulk of the muscle or anything like that. Um, it's improving because you've learned to do the movement a little bit more efficiently, I would say. Does, does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, I just want to point out that you mentioned that the task or the, the thing learned is directing your motor commands to the muscles, which mm -hmm. I don't totally agree with. I mean, um, could it equally be said that you're directing your uh, ability to shift your reference point of your thumb? Uh, well, you could, yes. <laughs> you could put it in those circumstances. I, 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 I just I, want to point out that there's a difference yeah. of, of philosophy in how movement is made and learned. So yeah, I yeah. just keep that in mind. Yeah, yeah. That's, that, it, just keep that in mind. Just go okay. with it. Uh, what, it. What it means, I suppose, is that the motor cortex is, is somehow involved in, in that process, where, however, it's, it, however it's done. That's all I'd, I'd say. Um, Anyway, the, the fact is that when you do these repetitive uh, stimuli to the brain, you can produce effects on performance. And the reason that's important is because it might be useful therapeutically. Imagine being able to change in some way the operation of the brain. Um, maybe you could use that to improve uh, responses in certain neurological diseases. So does all this work in the real world? Um, well, the best evidence that repetitive brain stimulation can do something is in depression. Um, many clinics around the world actually use RTMS to treat patients who have medically refractory depression. Uh, generally speaking, it's said to, to, make, to, to be quite effective. There's a good remission rate uh, and it's licensed as a medical treatment. In the motor control field, the situation's not quite as clear at all. In fact, not as clear at all. Um, and I'll show you why now. So in the motor control field, the therapeutic application um, is usually done with two different designs. Um, either you stimulate with before a behavioral therapy, as in the example I showed you in the healthy people, you give the stimulus, you improve the learning that's done afterwards, perhaps it would have the same effect on the response to the therapy in a clinical environment. You give the stimulation and the response to therapy might be more efficient afterwards. Uh, there are other designs where you just give stimulation alone with no particular behavioural therapy. That's exactly what they do in depression, um, which presumably would work through a different mechanism that I don't quite understand. Um, the other thing is that when you're doing it therapeutically, you often need multiple days of application before changes occur. Uh, and in the depression literature, they tend to refer to reaching a tipping point in a complex interconnecting network. Uh, in, in, in the motor control field, you might imagine building up uh, the effect over time uh, so that you gradually, by incremental steps, uh, achieve a better outcome over a longer period. Again, these are theoretical issues and precisely what's happening, uh, we don't really know. Um, therapy then. Um, one of the early um, applications for therapy was in stroke. I've talked about the recovery that usually happens after stroke. The question is, uh, perhaps you could speed it up um, and uh, make people better earlier or perhaps reach a, a higher plateau in, in their uh, recovery if you uh, treat them with some repetitive TMS. So this is one of the first studies in 2005. It's a nice study, it's 52 patients, two weeks after the stroke, randomly assigned to real and sham stimulation. So the 26 patients in real and sham groups. They have their normal therapy throughout and every day at the same time, they're given some repetitive TMS before some therapy. Uh, they're assessed before the stimulation. Uh, 10 days later, they have the therapy every day for 10 days, and then 10 days after that. So it's very short to follow up. And these are very big, uh, very, very global uh, stroke scales uh, that they're assessed with. 
The results look like this. Um, these are the scales, and there's two groups. There's a real group and a sham group. Both groups get better on this scale, better is up, on this scale, better is down. Uh, so both groups get better. That's what happens generally in stroke survivors. After two weeks, they tend to get better. Um, but the red group, which is a real TMS group, seems to get a little better, a little faster. Um, they're both the same at baseline, but the red group ends out 10 days later rather better than the sham group. These are very clear effects. That's why I've shown you the picture. But uh, other reports like this uh, came out shortly afterwards, and it did look as though this might be a reasonable option to pursue uh, in recovered patients. From, from this study, you don't know how long the recovery lasts or whether the blue group will catch up eventually with the red group, but it's very suggestive. It's quite exciting uh, as, as a finding. However, not all subsequent reports have been so successful and some contradictory. Uh, and especially if you look at chronic stroke, that study was two weeks after stroke, so it was an early study. Most of these studies in the literature are, are on chronic stroke. Um, and it may be difficult to, in chronic stroke to improve function for several reasons. It may also be difficult to improve function more than the best available physiotherapy alone. Um, and many centers are now using another form of brain stimulation called transcranial direct current stimulation during therapy. Um, so in stroke and motor control in general, um, clinical studies, the response to repetitive brain stimulation has not been brilliant. Um, the question is, why is it so bad, given that the rationale seemed to be very reasonable. I think I presented a fairly reasonable rationale for it. You know, it's plasticity in the brain. It might interfere, it interact with learning, it may be better, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so why doesn't it work as well as it should do? The reason really is that the response to TMS is variable. It varies a lot from one person to another. So let's go back to um, a motor cortex experiment in some healthy people. And this is an experiment on 50 healthy people. And we're going to look at the response before and after a continuous theta burst period of stimulation of the brain. So this is looking at how does this period of repetitive stimulation affect uh, the response of the excitability of the motor cortex. Well, we'll see for TBS, CTBS usually produces depression of excitability. So in these um, 30, 52 people, each individual is plotted on its own, and you see that the responses they tend to, uh, seem to tend to go down afterwards. But when you look at the responses to all 52 people, uh, what you see is becoming extremely messy. Uh, the individual responses are, in fact, all over the place. One person is different from another. In fact, the average here is virtually nothing. Um, so the response to repetitive TMS varies between people. It's fairly constant within a person, but different people are different. And when you think about it, it's actually not at all surprising. Because if we go back to the beginning, I told you TMS stimulates a lot of different sorts of neurons in the brain. They're excitatory, inhibitory, etc. Uh, and you can't target one group selectively. So when you do repetitive stimulation, you're getting a mixture of things. So even if you are affecting synapses, you're affecting different sorts of synapses. The number or the proportion of each sort of synapse is likely to be slightly different in different people because their brains are different. Uh, and so the stimulus doesn't have exactly the same effect on everyone. And so it's not at all surprising. And in fact, we should have expected this right at the start, that it would be very variable. And so it is. Um, so what can you do? Well, people say um, one possibility is that perhaps you could uh, try to make the uh, stimulus targeting a bit better. 
perhaps you could design different shapes or durations of electric uh, of, of pulses which would target particular subsets of neurons in the cortex. Uh, another approach says, well, in fact, the effect of brain stimulation depends upon the brain, the, the excitability of the brain, the time you stimulate it. In fact, that occurs within very rapid time courses. It actually depends upon the amount of EEG rhythms of, uh, in the brain at the time of the stimulus. So you could actually use EEG to gate the timing of the stimulus to an appropriate excitability of the cycle of the brain. Um, those are possible solutions, people are trying them out. But there's another way of looking at it, should you actually worry about variability? Uh, are you thinking about the response to these repetitive stimulation protocols in rather the wrong way? So, Here's another experiment from Cosi Ref and colleagues. It's an experiment in cats. It's a TMS experiment, and it's trying to look at what repetitive stimulation of the cat in the cat brain is actually doing. So they, they're working on the visual cortex, the primary visual cortex, and they're looking at what's called visual orientation maps. So in the primary visual cortex, certain areas of the primary visual cortex are responsive to lines of different orientation. If you think back to Hubel, Hubel and Wiesel, um, you can imagine that certain parts of the cortex are responsive to vertical lines, some responsive to horizontal lines, etc. Uh, and that gives you a visual orientation map. So we can look at what's the effect of repetitive TMS on the visual orientation map. It's easy to do, you just plot the map before and after a period of repetitive TMS. They're actually using 10 hertz repetitive TMS. Uh, and what you find is that after this, the maps don't change really, but the variability changes. The, the, the tuning of the areas to lines, to the orientation of the line, becomes rather less specific. It's like there's been noise added to the maps, made things more variable than they were. So that's, that's what happens when you look at the, the response to TMS in this sort of way. So it's rather different than looking at you know, the size of the MEP. This is looking at uh, a rather different way. The interesting thing is that in normal capsing, probably in normal humans, you can change the visual orientation maps in the cortex if you repetitively stimulate visually with lines of one particular orientation. So you can bias the visual orientation map towards horizontal if you present repeatedly over many sessions horizontal lines and simulated vertical lines. So you can change, you can shift the tuning somewhat it's rather difficult to do, but it's possible. However, what you find is that after some repetitive TMS, when the variability of the map has become higher, it's much easier to change the orientation map by this repeated stimulation with a, a grating of one orientation. It's made it easier to change the visual map. It's increased, shall we say, the plasticity of the cortex. I'll just give you an idea of how this is done. So it is complex, this, but this is supposed to be the visual cortex here on the left. The different colours represent areas that are responsive to different orientations of bars in, in the visual field. These are orientation maps. So if we take this, the red colours here, that says this bit of the cortex, for example, and that bit there. Uh, are responsive to vertical orientations, and the blue ones tend to be um, uh, horizontal orientations, and you've got all the orientations in between. So there's a map of the cat visual cortex. If you give some TMS, here, yeah, repetitive TMS, and test the map afterwards, the actual map is pretty similar. But the reproducibility, the variability of tuning within these areas is increased. 
it's grayed out in this particular uh, color scheme. Responses are not as reproducible and they're less specific, so they're noisier. Okay, that's the immediate effect of TMS. The interesting one is how it changes, how it makes it much easier after TMS to change the orientation map by repetitive stimulation. So again, this is a bit tricky, but let's have a look at it. This is visual orientation map here uh, before TMS, and then we give some repetitive TMS here, and then we give some persistent repetitive visual stimulation with lines of vertical lines. So what we see is that when we do the repetitive vertical lines, we can change the response, make it redder. So we bias the map towards red. And the fact is that this process has been made much easier after the TMS than it is after sham. Uh, this is a fraction of change after TMS versus sham in the preferred orientation here, the vertical line. You can do the same with horizontal lines, which is done here. So let me just summarize that. Repetitive TMS makes it much easier to change the orientation map in the visual cortex. And it does it by making the synaptic connections more variable and easier to change. And maybe this is exactly what is needed to interface our TMS with rehabilitation. Increased variability might be the secret that you need to achieve. Uh, and in fact, it has several uh, conclusions that, that go after that. If variability is a mechanism, it might not matter whether you use an excitatory or an inhibitory protocol, just anything that makes these maps and the synapses easier to change will do the trick. You don't need to necessarily produce excitation or inhibition. You produce a mixture anyway. Um, look at it as being more varied. Um, and there are various other things that might help here. Let me end briefly with an experiment that uses this after effect of repetitive TMS in a motor control setting in, human, in, in healthy people. So this is actually an extension of the experiment I showed you earlier of Marco Duvar looking at connectivity between the ventral premotor cortex and the motor cortex, ventral premotor cortex and the motor cortex prior to grasping. Now, remember the experiment. The experiment is you show someone an object and then they have to grasp it. In the period before they grasp it, the ventral premotor cortex seems to influence the pattern of excitability that builds up in the motor cortex uh, so that the muscles you activate are appropriate to the grasp that is needed to pick up the object. Uh, that's great. But where does the ventral premotor cortex get the information, the visual information from which tells it to prepare the appropriate grasp? Well, private experiments suggest that this information is coming from the anterior intraparietal cortex here, which is getting visual information amongst other things. And that can interpret the visual information in such a way as to send information down here, uh, which will activate the muscle plan to produce the movement. So if this uh, connectivity is correct, then what will happen if I interfere with the function of the anterior interparietal cortex? Uh, will that change the effectiveness of this interaction between premotor and motor cortex prior to the grasp? Will it make it less efficient? We can do that, and the experiment goes like this. The AIP, we do some repetitive stimulation, some CETBS, uh, to interfere with its function for the next half hour. So this isn't really a plasticity experiment or anything else. It says, when we give uh, RTMS, we're going to interfere with the function. We're going to change the synapses in that area. Now change the synapses, it will change the way that area processes information. I'll mess up the processing. If I mess up the processing here, how is that going to affect the grasp of the object? And in particular, how is it going to affect this transfer of information from ventral premotor to motor cortex. So let's do 
basically do exactly the same experiment as we did before, looking at ventral premotor to motor cortex connectivity before a grasp and see whether that is changed after I have done this repetitive CMS to the anterior interparietal cortex. So just to re reiterate, this is offline. You stimulate this first, and then you do your experiment. There's a control site here that you stimulate, uh, and when you stimulate that, it has no effect on the experiment, so I'm not going to show you those results. So over here is what I've shown you before. So this is a connectivity between the ventral premotor cortex and the motor cortex at different stimuli, at different interstimulus intervals. When you see a pen, the excitability uh, of the pathway from motor, premotor cortex, it tends to excite the FDI muscle, ready to grasp it. Whereas when you see uh, a large um, disc, then it excites the projection to the ADM muscle. When you do the virtual lesion to the AIP, the anterior parietal area, then the changes are much less, it's much less efficient. By interfering with the function of the parietal cortex, you've interfered somehow with the flow of that visual information to the premotor cortex, uh, which has then had this uh, effect on the motor cortex output. You can actually see, there we are, that um, this affects the muscle pattern during the grasp. So if I look at the EMG activity in the uh, first dorsal interosseous muscle here, the red, the EMG activity of the first dorsal interosseous muscle is greater when I reach for a pen and I reach for a disc, whereas the activity in the ADM muscle is less when I, uh, is most when I uh, lift a disc and rather than a pen. Uh, and this act, act, interfering with the function of the anterior parietal cortex uh, reduces this effect. It makes the grip activation much less specific to the object than it had been. And in fact, the two things correlate. So it gives you a model like this. The motor cortex is here. We have output to the first dorsal interosseous muscle, which we use for the pen grip output to the ADM muscle, which you use for the grasp of the disc. And we imagine that the premotor cortex has some outputs. One of the outputs activates the motor cortex in a way that is specific to um, grasping a disc. And one, uh, so if we activate this pathway, we will uh, excite the ADM muscle, and we will inhibit the 1DI muscle. I'm not John, excuse me. I'm not sure that we can see on the screen what you're trying to show because no. the mouse doesn't move, and it's still the previous picture with... Uh, oh, I see. That's the previous picture. Do you see a change in the picture? No. Oh. Uh, well, I'm the, the only unhappy one. Yeah. Uh, but uh -huh. maybe not. No, I. Right. How about now? Yeah. Now, now, there you go. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is the last slide. So we have the motor cortex here. It has an output to the first dorsal interosseous muscle here, which you activate to do the pen grip. It's got an output to the ADN muscle, which you activate to do the disc grip. And we imagine that in the premotor cortex, uh, there are some neurons. One set of neurons will have this sort of connectivity. It will excite the ADM muscle and inhibit the FDI muscle. We call that a grasp type output. And this is a pen type output, which inhibits the ADM muscle and excites the first dorsal interosseous muscle. So when we see objects of different types, the premotor cortex activates either one pathway or the other pathway, and these pathways produce a pattern of activity in motor cortex appropriate to the object to be grasped. The PMV obtains the visual information that allows it to specify which grasp from the AIP. So the AIP then, then activate the correct uh, one of these outputs, 
which will then activate the motor cortex. So that's the sort of model that you can get from this. Um, so at that point, I think I'll stop. I, I wanted simply to illustrate some of the ways that you can use TMS in motor control experiments. It's connectivity, it's lesion type experiments, and the repetitive stimulation uh, gives you persisting effects on an area of brain, which can be used in, in several different manner, manners from therapy to this sort of experiment. So I'll, uh, I'll stop there, Mark, and um, if there are any questions, I'll answer any, or I'll try. Well, thank you very much, John. So first, we're going to ask all the so-called active participants who are currently mm -hmm. on Zoom to ask their questions. So you can, um, if you have a question, unmute yourself. Uh, John, I have a question. Oh, hi, Robert. Hi. Uh, so there's an obvious contradiction between the use of RTMS uh, in the motor learning and stroke research that you were discussing, where you were interpreting the effects as introducing uh, noise and instability, which should be good for plasticity and change. Mm -hmm. And then the last study, which gave you this nice neuroanatomical model, where you pictured uh, that uh, RTMS was disrupting a process. So is this, whether it's disruptive or whether it's disruptive in a positive way, dependent simply on whether your behavioral uh, paradigm is learning versus performance? Uh, no, not exactly. I would I, I'd argue something rather different. If, if it's, it's making the, if the repetitive TMS is making the neural discharge pattern more variable, like it did in those CAT experiments, then I'd simply argue that that will actually interfere or make less efficient the, the processing of that area of brain. So it, it would disrupt it in, in a certain way. It would interfere with, with the function for a short period of time. Um, and um, that's what's happening. It's, it's, uh, does that make some sort of sense? Uh, all right, John. Can you uh, click on your chat? Yes. Uh, right. Oh, hold on a minute. I'll just stop sharing the screen for a start. That might okay. help. Okay. And yeah. then okay. you click on chat. Yeah. I've got chat. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And then you yeah. will see ten numbered questions from mm, yeah. collected from YouTube. If you go down, from the numbered from one. Okay. Uh, one. Yeah. So Are there? Would yeah. you? Yeah. I'll, I'll read that. Are there any side effects after virtual lesion protocols? Uh, no. Um, side effects are usually um, just related to perhaps to um, um, maybe headache, slight headache in certain people. If you do repetitive stimulation, that certain people get headache, probably due to the repetitive activation of skull muscles, uh, but um, no other side effects. If you use the um, TMS according to published safety guidelines, that's a very important point. Um, there are published safety guidelines, especially for repetitive TMS, uh, and you stay within those guidelines, you'll be safe. If you exceed them, you may not be safe, and you can produce seizures. If you turn the, um, the intensity to the right amount, stimulate the right bit of the brain at the right frequency, you can quite easily produce a seizure. But um, stick to the guidelines. Number two, do we know the values of specificity and sensitivity for stroke recovery or prediction? Uh, no, we don't. And um, at the moment, I would predict they're not very good. So. The, there's too much variability in the results that you get. Uh, some studies report very good effects, some don't. It's difficult to compare studies because they often use very different protocols and different uh, ways of behavioral training, etc. But on average, it's a bit of a mess. And even within studies, you find that patients' individual responses are also very variable. 
Um, so that's that. Number three doesn't have an answer. Number four um, says, do we know if there is a relationship between when we give the stimulus and how much delay we get? Um, oh, this is in delaying a movement. So if that's referring to the experiment where you can give a TMS pulse in the reaction period uh, and produce a delay in the onset of the movement, uh, yes, there is. The bigger the stimulus, the longer the delay, uh, but the movement still appears afterwards. So yes, there is a linear relationship, in fact. Um, in this short patient, where are we? Um, I say, uh, Using the RTMS in stroke patients, how do you control glutamate release and excited tox toxicity? Um, again, in stroke patients, there have been no side effects uh, of the sort you might expect from this. So um, I think this comes down to, again, staying within the published safety guidelines for um, uh, repetitive TMS. Um, various protocols have been used in stroke patients. Um, and like I said, there have been no reports of adverse effects apart from things like headache. Uh, next question. Expected outcomes on other conditions of plastic change, such as pain. Well, there's, there's a whole list of studies that have been done with RTMS for uh, lots of different conditions. Um, chronic pain. Um, there are several reports saying that the, there may be some transient effects on different types of chronic pain uh, if you do repetitive stimulation of the motor cortex um, if you don't know uh, implantation of uh, stimulators on the motor cortex is used for treatment of certain types of pain it's not always successful um, but it can be very useful in certain patients. Um, so the idea is rather than implanting an electric stimulator to the motor cortex, um, can you do this externally with repetitive TMS? And uh, there is some evidence that it might be possible. Some centers such as Paris actually use the response to TMS as a predictor of whether a patient uh, would respond to an implanted stimulator um, um, and, and they say that's quite successful. Uh, so, are different results between cortical and subcortical lesions? Uh, yes, people have reported different results between cortical and subcortical lesions. With cortical lesions, I think, my memory serves me correctly, having rather um, poorer responses uh, than subcortical lesions. But um, that's a very interesting idea. The idea would be that if you have got a, a fairly intact or undamaged motor cortex, then you might respond a little bit better to, to TMS. In fact, in reality, a lot of patients have a mixture of subcortical and cortical lesions. So it's, it's difficult to make uh, that distinction in most cases. Uh, is it possible to separate responders versus non-responders? That has been recommended by a few groups. Um, it, it, this is something that's been looked at quite a lot in depression, um, because there are responders and non-responders in depression. Um, and people have reported various possible ways of doing it, some related to connectivity uh, of the part of the brain you're stimulating. Some um, have, have, have done it with um, EEG patterns and so on. In the terms of um, motor control for re recovery of stroke, um, I can't remember is the answer. <laughs> uh, there, aren't, there aren't any successful ones that are not, shall I put it. Um, motor control, um, are subjects given feedback on the performance or is it self-assessed? So this is the RMS training this where you learn to do the uh, thumb abduction movement as rapidly as possible. Yes, people are giving feedback of their performance. They're, they're shown, or in some way or other, the, the acceleration that they produced on each trial 
um, after they've done it. Uh, and their objective is simply to try and get a higher acceleration on each trial. They're given no instructions on how to do it, they just have to find their way around and do the task. Um, for motor control, oh there, that's that. Um, chronic patients undergoing orthopedic surgery that allow movement in the biomechanical field, could the protocol help considering neuro neuroplasticity? For example, surgery to the release deformity and flexion of the elbow, allowing improvement of range of motion, could the protocol help in the motor control of this? Um, I don't quite understand that question. I, I'm, I'm really sorry to say. Um, so I'll pass on to uh, the next one, um, which was from Bob Sagerberg. Yes. So there's more messages. Um, isn't there a danger to excite motor neurons that are already hyper excitable, excitable in spasticity? Um, that's a question about spasticity. So I don't think there's any danger in that. The motor neurons may be more excitable, but um, I don't see the problem. After all, voluntary movement tries to excite them. So this is just a single TMS pulse. I'm, I'm not quite sure why it would be a problem. It's certainly been done and no reports of adverse effects as far as I know. Uh, would stimulation be useful for after spinal cord injury? Uh, yes, it probably would be. Uh, some studies have tried to show, to probe that. Although I suppose at the present time, more interested is, is now in implanted stimulation of spinal cord uh, as, as uh, recovery from stroke. And finally, uh, M1 a gateway to pain work, pain networks, or is it truly involved in pain processing? Well, it's not involved in pain processing, but uh, and precisely what role it plays in pain processing, I don't know. But the idea uh, is that it might be some sort of gateway into the pain networks. Personally, I don't know what, what a really rational theory would be. Um, as far as I know, the initial observation was just made by a neurosurgeon that stimulation of M1 could help relieve certain forms of pain in patients. The rationale um, is, is obviously complex and, and depends upon a network type of activation pattern. Uh, and that's all I'd say. So I think that's all the questions done. Um, <laughs> All right, so are there any other questions? If not, uh, we're going to thank John. No, Anatole has a question. Oh, Anatole. Sorry, sorry. I think that's uh, thinking about the uh, um, simulation of the brain um, should be considered as a perturbation. And um, as um, most of dynamical system brain mm -hmm. have tendency to resist uh, or compensate ah. for this perturbation. Yes. So the first sign of this mechanism is silent period uh, after stimulation. Mm -hmm. So maybe um, useful effect of, of stimulation, say uh, uh, repeated, uh, repeated stimulation are hidden by this resistant mechanism. Maybe ah. this, this, this kind of reaction should be studied uh, to uh, maybe identify uh, true helpful uh, uh, make a true aspect of stimulation of TMS or, or, or so. Just, just, my, just opinion, uh, uh, maybe this side uh, should have and we should have in mind this uh, um, yeah. resisting, resisting reaction. Uh, yeah, to yeah. I, I, I think Anatole, I, I, I would agree with that. I mean, in, in a way, you can see that happens for, it, it, to a certain extent, because when you do the repetitive stimulation, the effect is transitory. It, it only lasts for a short period of time, and, it, and, and the system does indeed come back 
to its pre-existing state. So, so certainly from that point of view, th there is this sort of homeostatic uh, effect in the brain. It does resist the, the change that you're trying to apply to it. Uh, and that's why you've just got this short period, in, at least in the healthy brain, in, in which to work after the repetitive stimulation. Another thing, uh, uh, I remember that you have uh, very interesting data um, uh, um, showing uh, uh, morphological changes of, uh, of synaptic transmission during simulation. Uh, it, it would be, uh, you, you didn't repeat uh, in this uh, 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 talk uh, uh -huh. this, this, uh, uh, this result. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's very interesting. <laughs> There's many things I didn't say in this talk, yes. <laughs> Enormous amounts that I left out. But yeah, yeah, there are there are changes after repetitive TMS, anatomical changes you can sometimes see. Effectively, they're anatomical changes. But um, um, yeah, I, okay, I missed them out. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, are there any other questions or comments? Now we can applaud John. Ah, Say thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, uh, let me, well, before we raise a toast to John, well, first of all, everybody has a chance to get a, you know, a drink of choice. Uh, but while you are doing that, I want to remind you that next week we have two talks about the hand and the arm about reaching and grasping and uh, everything so everything you wanted to know about the hand so on tuesday Euron smith is going to be our speaker from free university and then on saturday marco santello uh, will uh, continue marco is from arizona state so after hearing a little bit of british english we are back to corrupted english uh, <laughs> That's so, uh, but in different ways, corrupted uh, in, in very different ways. Yeah. All right, so, uh, John, uh, thank you very much for your wonderful talk. Here's to John. <laughs> I'm shame. dry at the moment. That's shame, shame. I'll go and get some now. <laughs> it's all right. That's fine. Okay. See you on Tuesday. See you all. I hope to see you all on Tuesday. Okay, thank you all very much. Yeah, bye, yeah, bye. Thank you. All right. Bye bye. bye. John, I'm John, gonna, I'm gonna you send you all the, all the, 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 the questions. questions. Could you write, Could you write a, paragraph a paragraph for each one? one? Because then I'm gonna, then gonna, then gonna post. post. Oh, okay. I have to. I have to do some homework. Yeah, yeah, kind of. <laughs> kind of. Because, because, because then we then can, we put, can put everything on the is ISMC website as well. Just, just send me them, and I'll, I'll do them tomorrow, probably. Okay. 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 Did, did you do that for us too? Yes. Um, yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. I'll do that, I'll do that as, well. as well. Okay. Good. Okay. We'll, we'll take care of it. Okay. 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 Great. Okay. Thank you, okay. Luis, for your uh, thank attention. You. Thank you, everybody. See you, everybody. See you everybody. Bye. 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 So fellows, so fellows now, now we have, have ended ended more, more one more, more lecture. lecture. Uh, I, hope uh, I hope you enjoyed. enjoyed. And I'm gonna see you, see you next, next Tuesday. Tuesday. Okay. okay. Have a nice, have a nice week weekend. weekend. Safe, Safe and nice, and nice, nice weekend. weekend. Now it's, now it's here. here. So, so see you, see you Tuesday. Tuesday. Bye bye. Bye bye.